So hello, welcome to my session. My name is Martin Stefanko. Today we are going to talk about Project Gloom and Virtual Threads. So just really quickly, because we don't have much time, I'm uh, doing a bunch of stuff, but most importantly, I'm coding in Java, so I know a bit of two about these things. And you can find me everywhere on the internet as xstefank. So uh, I want to start this session always with a question, do you think, because I suppose you are a Java developers if you are here, do you think that Project Gloom is the future of Java? Who thinks so? Well, not so many people. OK, so uh, I want to really quickly go over how we are treating basically threads in Java since the beginning of Java, because you need to have a full picture. So I will start with normal Java processing before JDK 19, where there was Project Loom introduced as preview. We had a normal blocking code, as everybody knows how it basically works. If you do some remote I.O. or even local I.O. operation, which needs to block, basically, uh, you will always block the thread on which you are running. Basically, when you, your, for instance, this get method is called, uh, the application server or uh, your framework will allocate a single thread which is going to execute or handle the execution of everything inside this method. So that means that if you block your thread, you are blocking basically everything. And when you get back the response from IO, like the S2 uppercase, you can continue the execution. When your method is finished, you will just return the thread back to some pool, and basically it can be reused by somebody else. Of course, this works nicely, but it has its limitations. So as I said, you will get a single platform thread, real operating sister thread, which is typically expensive to create, and it takes a bunch of resources, and you will start executing your request. When you will get to the point where you need to actually execute the remote I.O., you will basically block. Nobody else is able to do anything with these threads for the duration of the remote call. And when you are finished, you are finished. This is, of course, uh, happening in parallel. So if you have multiple threads in between, you will just plan more threads. But the, as I mentioned, they are taking uh, some resources, specifically memory. So you can create only that many r real operating system, real platform threads in Java until you will run basically with uh, out of memory error. And of course, you will just continue doing this until you can. Because this is a limitation, because we basically can only create that many threads, uh, we came up with an idea of reactive programming. Reactive programming is nothing fancy. It's just a different way of how you're writing the same code. And you are writing it with something which we call uh, continuations. So that means that you need to basically think a little bit differently about how you are typing your code. And as you can see here, basically, I am, and this is interesting. This doesn't work. That's nice. Of course, live demo. Uh, well, you can see there basically that reactive get is now not blocking. That map operation is actually a continuation. So that means that I will tell my framework that when I will get back my HTTP response from the reactive get, execute this string to uppercase. But my code is not blocked. My method is actually that the uni result is uh, reactive uh, result of single result or exception from small rhyme mutiny. So basically, when somebody calls this call method, they are not blocked until they choose so. Uh, how this works is basically very similar, but now we have very small number of real platform threads, which we call event loops, which are basically handling our execution for us. So when I will get a new request and I want to execute some code, I will find a free event loop. Typically, there are a few of them. And I will start executing my code on this event loop. When I will get to the point where I need to block, I am not actually blocking. I am just registering that uh, continuation. And basically, I am not using the thread anymore. I am basically, I just stop. When there are different requests coming in between, and they see that the event loop is not utilized, it can be reused for different threads. So you already see where basically we are getting or like saving processing with Reactive, because we can basically reuse the same thread with multiple requests or multiple tasks. When I will get back a response from that first request, that red one, I can again just find a free event loop. And in my example, I am just for simplicity having only one. And I will basically just finish the execution of that first request. Similarly, for the second request, if I have something in between, I will just do exactly the same thing. I don't really need to execute something when I'm blocking some of the requests. But you already see that I'm utilizing single thread way more than I did with the traditional processing. Because basically, when something is blocked, it's not blocking the actual execution of my system. And yet you are just continuing doing this forever. When you are doing reactive, there is a single golden rule that you need to obey. Never ever block the event loop thread. 
Because if you will, if somebody would decide to block the execution on this event loop thread, this whole model goes sideways, politely. Uh, so actually, if you try to do something like this in Quarkus, uh, after, by default, 200, uh, two seconds, you will basically get an exception which will not stop your execution, but you will have, have a stack trace printed that this is not something you should do because you are blocking other executions. And here comes virtual threads. Virtual threads are basically something in between normal processing and reactive, and you will see this in a minute. So from your perspective, from a user perspective, you are still writing exactly the same code as you did with uh, normal traditional threads. You, only in Quarkus you need to de add this run on virtual thread annotation, which is uh, how we decided, because in Quarkus, Basically, you don't have a global switch that can basically switch all your executions to virtual threads, at least for now. So you need to annotate either methods or classes, CDI beans, with this run on virtual thread annotation if you want to move the execution on virtual thread. But in like uh, Spring Boot, there is a global switch, so you don't need to do anything. So from your perspective, exactly the same code. So where the magic happens is actually in the JDK itself. Now we have two types of threads, virtual threads, the ones that you deal with, and carrier threads. Carrier threads are actual platform threads which are going to execute your virtual threads. So this carrier thread is a real operating system thread, that expensive resource that I was talking about. So when you will get the request, you will create a new virtual thread, which is only a concept inside the JDK itself. This is not a real thread. And you will start executing your request on this virtual thread. What this means, that the JDK now will find a free carrier thread and it will really assign this virtual thread execution to a real operating system thread to execute it. When you will get to the point where you need to block, basically what JDK does is similarly as reactive, just unmap the execution of that first virtual thread from the carrier thread and it will continue to block but only that virtual concept, that virtual thread. So your carrier thread can be now reused by some other virtual threads. And this is exactly what is happening. New request will create a new virtual thread, two in my case, and again JDK will find a free carrier thread that can execute it. So you can see that I'm already reusing the same carrier thread similarly as with reactive. And again, you are just blocking the virtual thread. And you, of course, when you will get back the response, you will do exactly the same thing. This is basically just a, a queue of uh, requests, and you are just finding a free platform thread or carrier thread to execute it. So when you are, this is important, when you are finished with execution of virtual threads, you are basically throwing them away. Virtual threads are not something which is meant to be reused. It's not something that should be pulled or in any way thinked as a long uh, lived object. Basically, the idea of virtual threads is fire and forget. So basically, you really want to just create, execute your task, and you will just garbage collect it. And this continues until you are finished. Of course, that I can go a little bit faster. You, you get the idea. What I want to really do is to put these two models side to side, or like that whole execution side to side, because as you can probably see, this upper part looks very closely to that traditional processing that we used to have with normal threads, and this bottom part looks very closely to reactive. And this is actually that whole magic that Project Loom is doing. They just moved the complexity of reactive code into the JDK itself. And here the problem starts. Basically, because it's now inside the JDK itself, we, from the framework perspective, don't really have any access to influence in any way the execution of the carrier threat. And uh, what can happen and what will happen, I will show you in a minute. Probably I can already, oh, I will do the code uh, together. Uh, Basically, what will happen when you don't, you have a virtual thread execution or you have a task that you want to execute on carrier threads and you don't have enough carrier threads, JDK will actually create a new platform thread, new carrier threads to add, add them to the pool so you can basically scale better. And of course, this can also eventually run into the same issues as you had with traditional threads, just it will get there probably a little bit slower. But the same issues still persist, and you should be aware that this can happen. So there are five main areas of problems that we identified so far. Uh, pinning, monopolization, scaling, which I just mentioned, which I, is direct uh, 
uh, basically result of the first two uh, thread locals and concurrent access, and we will go through all of them. But before that, I want to show you a little bit of code. And probably I will put this into the different pocket because like, I like to code, so it's better to code. So I have actually coded all these examples that I was showing you on the slides in this simple application. I don't really think that I need to go over the code. So I will just start that application in dev mode. Uh, yeah, it's a Quarkus application, so at least I can have a, a live reload. And I will open it in, yeah. Uh, in a browser. This is a very simple UI because I'm a backend engineer, uh, where basically I can just either call blocking reactive or virtual. So I want to show you what will happen if I will try to generate 1,000 requests to my blocking resource, that one which is actually just, we can look here, just call the blocking get and just then call the uppercase. As you can see, where is it? It will be able to only do 200 concurrent requests in par parallel. And why is that? Is because actually in Quarkus, we basically only allow you out of the box to create 200 real platform threads. So if I check my logs, you will see that it really created 200 threads and then it finished. Because I have live reload, I can just change the config and where is it? If I just uh, refresh this and call it again, you will now see that I'm getting into 1,000 maximum concurrency, but I really created now 1,000 threads. And if you would be able to see my resources, you would see like a little bit of spike, like, but it's like very small example because I'm on a demo. And I, uh, so it's uh, not that critical now to basically like show you. Uh, how my machine can run out of memory. <laughs> uh, if I would try to do this with reactive, I will get exactly the same execution because it's doing exactly the same thing. But inside the log, you will see that now I'm running on that event loop thread. So every, every execution is calling on event loop. And if I would be scrolling this a little bit, come on, of course, live demos. Yeah, you can see that out of the box, I have only two event loop threads, which are now handling all of the requests in parallel. So I'm from 1,000 threads now down to two. And of course, if I would try to do this with virtual, virtual, I will do again the same thing. But this time, oops, that's too big. You will see that we are running on some virtual threads uh, with some like numbers. I have 4,000 of them because uh, Actually, I am misusing, where is the generator? Generate resource. I am actually mis misusing virtual threads to generate the request to my own application. So that's why you see 4,000. But it's like only creating 1,000 virtual threads. What is important is this actually that second part, which is now a little bit not nicely shown, where you can see these worker threads from fork join pool. This is the actual carrier thread that is executing my request. So you can see that I have like 18, 19, yeah, probably a few, 21 I, I saw somewhere. So I, I have a bunch of them created. And I will actually restart this because I want to prove some point. And probably I will open a new terminal. So when you will start a new application, by default, that for join pool, which is actually going to handle your carrier threads, oops, not this one, is actually going to create exactly the number of processor or, or cores that you have, number of uh, virtual threads. Oh, sorry, carrier threads. So basically, I have 16 cores in this machine, so it created 16 carrier threads out of the box. I am just using a uh, slight magic to basically just find the ID of that uh, Java application and basically with JSTAG just to count that worker threads. What will happen now if I generate, again, 1,000 requests to my virtual resource, you will see that the number of uh, that carrier threads already rose to 38. Just because I was not able to do it fast enough, uh, JDK already decided to spin another uh, 12, 20, ah, 22 uh, virtual threads. So basically, you can see already here that point that I'm making. Already, I am getting to more threads that I originally thought. It's just way slower. The actual code is really the one that I had inside that uh, uh, presentation. So I just edit run on virtual thread on that method. 
uh, I also showed you one different way how you can use at least in Quarkus uh, virtual threads because we gave you this at virtual threads annotation which can exec uh, inject uh, executor service into any CDI bin. This is what I'm using to gener generate uh, requests. And actually, I am also using reactive messaging on the background to do that concurrency counting, just uh, so you have the full picture. But okay, let's now move to the actual problems because this is what is interesting. So, what is pinning? Pinning is basically a state where JDK cannot unmount the execution of virtual thread from the carrier thread. Sometimes in a few cases, it just happens that you basically need to also block that carrier thread similarly as the traditional processing when you are blocking the virtual thread. Of course, you remember that uh, I told you that you should never ever block that uh, event loop thread and with Project Loom, carrier thread is my event loop thread, so this is bad. Uh, this happens now in two cases, when you are doing uh, basically a synchronized or uh, uh, synchronized block and inside that you try to unpin or when you have a native call uh, on your stack. Uh, actually, that synchronized case should be resolved in JDK 23 and it's on my to-do list because there was like branching out of JDK 23 last week to try when, whether they fixed it. But uh, currently, at least in 21, 22, this is still the case. And uh, for the native calls, we counted 13 native libraries in Quarkus core. So if it happens that you are lucky enough that you try to unmount your virtual thread and you have those 13 libraries in your stack, then you cannot. So with that, I prepared a really simple, basically, uh, main method, which we will basically use to try to basically play with virtual threads a little bit because I want to show you a few parameters. So inside this, I will show you now because we have uh, we have good time how to create a virtual thread. So with JDK 19, I believe you got this off virtual method or off platform if you want to create a normal thread, which is a static method that can create virtual thread where I can basically just start new virtual thread and oh if I type the correct parentheses what yeah I can type and I just have this log method that will do a little bit of nicer logging and uh, what I will do here is thread a start then I have a really simple sleep and not thread B start, but thread A end. And of course, if I want to see something, let's call it T1, I need to actually, come on, I need to wait for it to finish. Oh, join. So if I now try to execute this and I'm running on latest uh, JDK with uh, enable preview, we will get what we expect in 100 millisecond. I have my one virtual thread, 28 executed on one carrier thread. If I try to duplicate this, hopefully, oops, no, just do T2 and B, B and T2, then I will get two threads executed and you can see already that they are being executed on different uh, carrier threads because as I said in the beginning, I have 16 out of the box created. So thread B started on two and ended on four. That's totally fine. What I want to, well, yeah. What I want to show you because like this is nice but nobody is ever creating threads like this. At least I hope you are not. And not this one, this I need. Uh, you can also create basically executors, new virtual, new virtual thread per executor, which is a normal executor service which you can submit to. But uh, the problem with this one, and I will not show it because we don't have time, is that it by default uh, just create virtual threads which are not even, well, you can see it already here, that don't have any names, which is extremely hard to debug when you have thousands or bigger thousands or millions of them. So what I recommend you to do is actually you can on that thread create this uh, virtual thread name. We are at devconf cz 
and we will start at zero, and you can do factory here, which will give you a thread factory, and then instead of this new virtual thread per executor, you will do new uh, thread per task executor, to which you will pass this factory, and now, maybe I could save this because, oops, I don't need to retype it. And let's do it like this. And now, instead of this start, I will do executor service submit. And this will give me a future, future one. Let's do the same here. So instead of start executor service submit, and this will be F2. And here F1 get F2. F2 get. So now I will basically get exactly the same execution. Just now I'm using executor service. And what you can see here that you will get a name, which is really nice when you are working with multiple of them. OK, so to demonstrate the issues uh, or the pinning as we started it, I actually have, and I think it's like this, I have prepared uh, basically the same thing, just with a bunch of uh, parameters, which are actually configuring that forgery pool that is uh, basically handling that carrier threads. So basically now I'm telling with these three properties, uh, I will have, or I limit, JDK limit the fork join pool for carrier threads to only one thread. So what will happen if I do it? You will see that basically I'm serializing the execution of those two virtual threads because they have only single worker thread, worker, thread, worker one. And you should see that it, they can uh, like start in parallel, the, almost in parallel, because they, when I will get into that sleep, that, that is actually my uh, uh, Opera IO operation that will unmount my execution from the virtual thread. So I am still having only single uh, platform thread, but every virtual thread is basically unmounted when we will get to sleep. So I am still getting similar times. Now, what that pinning is, basically, if I just take this uh, first thread and I will just put it into, synchronize this, it's OK, into a synchronized block, Come on, I cannot type correct uh, parentheses. You will see that basically now JDK is unable to unmount my thread A from uh, that single carrier thread. So my thread A execute first, and only then I can mount uh, thread B and execute thread B. So this is that issue that basically uh, just because I'm out of threads, I am basically now serializing everything. Of course, if I allow to create new threads, because this parallelism is basically what I'm starting with. This is uh, the initial size. Max pool size is what it can scale maximal, maximally to, and min runnable is minimum runnable threads. If I put it into two, yeah, I was lucky today. You should see that if I allow it to scale, so I'm starting with one, but it sees that I have a second thread that wants to execute, and I don't have a free thread, it will create a new worker. It doesn't matter how it's called, of worker one, worker two, they can execute their individual task. So the issue is solved. But of course, if I'm out of threads, I'm still serializing. This is the issue. Uh, basically, uh, at least for now, there is a single way how to get around this. And for that, I will actually take this method outside. Yeah, it's called accept signature. Okay, I don't know. Okay, let's call it like this. That's okay. So I, I will just now, I should be getting everything, yes, in parallel. If I just now make this extracted method synchronized, of course, I will have the exactly same thing. And uh, I just want to mention that this is, of course, not something that you need to have in your code. If you are calling any library that is having a synchronized method, this will still be the same case. So uh, if you want to fix it, or you have an option how to fix it, just do it desynchronize, and you can use uh, uh, reentrant lock, just call it lock, maybe new reentrant lock. And inside my method, I can just do lock, lock, maybe static, because this is static, lock, 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 and then 
Uh, finally, look, come on. Thank you. Look, unlock. So this is now functionally doing exactly the same thing, but you will see that now I am uh, not pinning that virtual thread. So this is the recommended way how you should handle uh, synchronized, uh, synchronized blocks, uh, at least now, before we have JDK 23. So uh, let me put this back because, uh, no, because we, I want to have it in one place. So this would be synchronized problems. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. There is also this flag, but we are running slightly out of time, so I will just not show it. Basically, that pinning uh, event, it's like a pinning event. This is actually an execution of method on the thread class itself, so you can actually catch this, and JDK will basically just print uh, either full or short stack trace, uh, if you will do so. Actually, well, maybe I can show this. In uh, Quarkus, we created a library which basically can do this automatically for you. So if you will add this virtual thread unit and you will annotate your uh, method with this uh, should not pin annotation, uh, when you will run this method, am I running still dev mode? So I am still running dev mode. And probably I can show you now, or I will show it later. Now I'm running my two tests. Uh, if you are not familiar with Quarkus continuous testing, I, if I just press R here, it will run my tests in the background. So you see that all my two tests are passing. But if I go into my virtual, not, it says problems resource, which is a testing, and I will just pin the carrier thread. And if I just uh, rerun those tests, why are not? Ah, they are already rerun you will see that I am now failing this and I should see in a moment that the test endpoint was expected not to pin and we are pinning. If I would do it, sorry, uh, with that uh, lock, it should now be passing. If I go now, you will see that just by saving that file, that continuous testing automatically picks that I need to rerun the test and you see that all two tests are now again passing. So this is just the automation because it's just uh, catching basically that uh, exception and it's uh, printing that. OK, second issue, which is actually something which we cannot uh, work around in any way, is uh, monopolization or utilization of the thread itself. If you just continue executing some computation, which just takes some time on virtual thread, you will also basically just block the uh, carrier thread. And this is actually very easy to show uh, because if I just go back into my virtual thread and instead of that, uh, instead of sleep, I will just do while loop forever here and comment this out in my thread A. What did I do? Not this one. Uh, if I try to execute this now, on one thread, you will see that I will never get to executing my virtual thread B because now virtual thread A will be blocking that single carrier thread forever. Really, again, easy example how basically this model will not scale. If I would try to do the same, if I would try to block my reactive resource, so here before I will call my reactive get because like when I'm returning uni in Quarkus, it automatically runs on event loop. So if I would try to block here and I can just do thread sleep for let's say five seconds and I would try to call that should be still running don't worry because like when I'm saving files in between it can uh, basically just not compile and this is reactive I believe we should see hopefully yeah we see that Actually, Quarkus will not allow me to block this because uh, I was blocking the event loop thread for 2.7 seconds and I shouldn't. So this is not something that we can catch with virtual threads because they are out of our execution or out of our control. And basically, if we put these two things together, you can see already my point that basically JDK can scale your fork join pool to multiple threads, and you are running basically into the same issues as with traditional threads, just slowly. The, uh, 
default uh, of maximum threads is actually, I think, also, uh, no, it's 256. Uh, that max pool size is 256. So, of course, you will not, basically, thank you, uh, run out of memory, typically, if you are not very restricted in your environment, but, of course, you will not scale that much. So, again, it's something that you need to keep in mind. I already showed you these three uh, properties, and I don't think that I need to go over them again. One last issue that is possibly a uh, problem, because it depends what kind of code you are using, is thread locals. Because, as you know, thread local is an object which is basically uh, mapped to a particular thread, which is very much used typically for transactions, uh, object mapping, and etc. Because we know that we have this pool of threads which are used for every request, it is actually a better idea to cache expensive objects in thread locals, so they can be actually reused with every request which is going to be allocated to this particular thread. But with uh, uh, virtual threads, you want to actually create new virtual thread for every request and then just throw it away. So they actually added the support for thread locals later, and now you can use thread locals fully with virtual threads, but what will happen, it will actually copy the value of the virtual thread for every, uh, of the thread local to every virtual thread. So especially if you are using very expensive objects, which like uh, JSON mapping, etc., that expensive objects was particularly created with the idea as a thread local because it's expensive. Now you are going to create a new copy for every virtual thread. And this is actually really easy to show, but I will not do it. Basically, you will get my idea. It will just create a new uh, thread local for every virtual thread. Uh, and of course, the last but not least, concurrency. Now you are writing concurrent code, even if it's not looking as concurrent code. So just please use thread safe variants because you can run into very unexpected issues. Okay, I have good time. So now who thinks that you know, Loom is the future of Java? I always get more hands, that's nice. Even when I'm talking about problems. Uh, I also think that uh, this is the future of Java, just the road until we will get there is quite long because uh, basically we have solution for most of these issues, but the issue that I see is that the most of these issues are not in your code or end user code, but are in the libraries, so like Hibernate, Jackson, etc. And Java ecosystem is very vast, so it will take some time until we update everything to actually solve all these issues. But until we will get there, Quarkus will probably just not allow you to basically shoot yourself into your own leg, and you need to annotate everything explicitly so you are aware that this method is actually running on virtual thread. So with that, I really think that the Loom is the future of Java. And more or less, this is everything from my side. So you already heard from the last session that I'm writing a book with previous speaker. So if you want to, there is a 45% discount on this QR code. And I will take some questions. No questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, in preview, they were in, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the question is, since which version are virtual threads in JDK? So as a preview, they were introduced in 19 as, as a final feature in 21. OK. Oh. OK, so one question regarding the definition example where essentially using synchronized on this would be defining the thread down. Wasn't that actually caused by the fact that you were essentially no, it doesn't matter. It just needs, oh, sorry. Uh, the question is if that pinning event from a synchronized block wasn't caused by the, uh, basically, uh, the object on which I was synchronizing was the object in which I called the method. It's, no, it just needs to be a synchronized block because I also did it with a synchronized method. So it just needs to be a synchronized block. It doesn't matter on which you are synchronizing. Yeah, but I don't really think that you need to synchronize on this. This is just like easier if you even synchronize on a different object. It doesn't matter. It's just inside the synchronized block. So it doesn't matter. This is the answer. Okay, any more questions?
If no, then thank you for your attention.